Christ Community Church, located at 25th and Thomas Avenue in Portsmouth, Ohio. Most of us remember that day. It's etched in our minds, a permanent reminder of tragedy. We all watched helplessly as lives were lost, heroes were born, and a nation was forever changed. The loss was unimaginable, the sorrow unbearable. But through that pain, we witnessed the resolve of a nation. We saw chaos give birth to courage, fear transform into fortitude, and destruction give way to determination. In the midst of the brokenness, freedom stood immovable. Today, we remember those we lost. We honor the heroes who saved so many and grieve with the families who have suffered so much. It's been 20 years, but we still remember and we will never forget. Well, it has been 20 years, hard to imagine, it's 20 years ago, 9-11. Uh, I know that those of you old enough will always remember where you were um, when you got the news. I was actually just a couple hours drive outside of New York City uh, when it happened. I was in law school, my first year of law school, um, at Cornell in Ithaca, New York, and I was sitting, and there was a student center. It was before my torts class, and they had the Today Show on. I was sitting there going over my notes, and the report came in that a plane had hit the World Trade Center. I thought, well, that's strange. And, and they go there, and then I watched the second plane hit, and I looked over to the student next to me, and I said, this is Pearl Harbor. And, but then, a little bit later, they canceled classes. Almost every student just jammed in to the student center. We were all sitting there watching TV, you know, maybe 200 of us. And one of the towers fell. And sitting in a couch across from me was a young woman who both of her parents worked in that tower. And she lost both her parents that day. She looked to the air and she shrieked. I will never forget that and we should never, ever forget. Um, but, something to be proud of. I don't know if you caught this online or not, but uh, one of our own, Dale King, his parents, Lou and Carolyn, are sitting right over there, were part of a veterans march yesterday. Dale marched 50 miles to ground zero yesterday. And so when you see him, I messaged him last night, you know, I knew he wouldn't be here this morning, but next time you see him, tell him thank you for his service and thank you for what he's doing. Um, if you got a bulletin, and you should, inside, there is a little insert. One is from me, which we'll get to later. The other side is a little thing gauging interest in a church trip, either to Uganda, maybe when... Um, Patrick gets married, which he will in the spring, or perhaps when they officially kick off Christ Community Church, Uganda, if you're interested in that, or a trip to Israel. Now, I have to say this about the trip to Israel. Um, I've been, a number of you have been. If you haven't, it is expensive, but it's worth it. There's just something about, you know, it, it's, it, they will try to sell you all kinds of tchotchkes. It's kind of touristy, all that kind of stuff. But to be on the Sea of Galilee... I remember going with Ralph, and Ralph was right in front of me, and we were climbing the steps up to where Solomon's temple and Herod's temple once stood. And Ralph just looked back at me, had tears in his eyes, had a big smile on his face. He said, I'm walking in the same place Jesus did. And that is kind of cool. So if that's something you want to do, fill that out. You can just put it back in the um, offering towers, but whatever we call them back there. Um, and you can do that. Finally, before we jump into 
sermon series. Some folks who are here that I want to thank. Um, John and Sandy Klein, when you pulled in, you probably noticed the parking lot looks really good. That's because of them. Thank you guys so very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Ah, good deal. All right. This morning we're doing something a little different. This is our Back to Basic series. Up into December, we'll be covering kind of the core things that define Christianity. Two weeks ago, I did the existence of God and the nature of God. Last week, Dad did the Bible as the Word of God. Today, we're doing how do you study the Word of God? How do you know the Word of God? And folks, we must take this very, very seriously because we're in all kinds of trouble in our country, not just politically, but spiritually and morally, and that's because primarily even people who identify as Christians do not know the Word of God. They just don't. This is from, uh, it's in your bulletin, but I'll, I'll just point it out. Dr. Al Moeller, who's the president of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, wrote a few years ago, fewer than half of all adults in America can name the four Gospels. Many Christians cannot identify more than two or three of the disciples. Uh, by the way, please, if you're pulled, Mark and Luke were not disciples. Just because they have a gospel with their name on it, they were not among the twelve. Just don't, don't embarrass me. According to data from Barner Research Group, 60% of Americans can't name five of the Ten Commandments. George Barner wrote, George Barner's kind of the gallop of Christianity, he said, no wonder people break the Ten Commandments all the time. They don't even know what they are. The bottom line, he said, America is biblically illiterate. And what you will find is this is, this is funny but sad. I mean, uh, Megan has pointed this out on her blog and her podcast through the Bold Movement. A survey just a few years ago found that 50% of high school graduates in America thought Joan of Arc was Noah's wife. That's bad. And even if some Christians, they call themselves Christians, they go to church, they hold beliefs that are contrary to what Scripture clearly teaches, such as, 72% of Christians said people are basically good. Is that what the Bible teaches? What does the prophet Jeremiah say? The heart is wicked. It cannot be trusted. What does Paul say in Romans 1 and 2? We are all sinners. 52% of Christians today in America say there's no such thing as absolute truth. And, of course, you know how I always reply to that. There's no such thing as absolute truth. Well, is that true? Because if you're right, you're wrong. It's a silly thing to say. 58% of Christians believe the Holy Spirit is not a real living being. 64% of Christians say all faiths are of equal value. Really? I'll take you to Iran and see what you think. 57% of Christians say they believe in karma. Folks, karma is an Eastern idea that states that if you do good things, good things will come to you. Why would Christians whose faith is centered on a perfect human being, fully God, fully human, who did nothing but heal and love, did nothing but good, and what did it get him? torture, and death. What does Jesus say to us? Pick up your what and follow me? Cross, which means be prepared to die and follow me. Does that sound like karma? I don't think so. People don't know their Bible. Now, part of the problem, and the reason I inserted this into the preaching schedule, we typically actually plan our sermon series out like a year ahead of time. But here, what I had to do was I had to call an audible and, and slide this one in because I've had several people say, Matt, I, I just don't understand the Bible. Well, 
hopefully, by the time I'm done today, you won't have that excuse. Now, here's the first thing you need to do. Get yourself a good study Bible. Most of the time, when I run into people say, I just don't understand the Bible, they're like holding a King James or something like that, I'm like, you're not going to understand that. Look, if you look at this little insert on the back, reading levels for Bible translations, this comes from christianbook.com. I didn't make this up. And this is several years old. It's actually a little outdated. It's gone up since then. To read and understand the King James Version, you need to have a college-level reading level. That's where you need to be. Now, the simple fact is most of us don't read daily, don't read in depth, and so this has nothing to do with your intelligence. It's just a fact that if you don't read every day, if you don't read for fun or information or so forth, if you're not a reader, what's the likelihood you're going to be able to understand the King James? It's not going to happen. Bible translations, which unfortunately are usually done by committee, are done with a specific purpose in mind. They're translating from the Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic, which is what the Bible was written in. The Bible was not written in English. It was not. So there's nothing sacred about the English language. And I'll get to more of that here in a second. Bible translations are written to different reading levels. And so, if you can't understand the edition you're reading, go get another one. And get yourself a good study Bible. Because a study Bible will do all kinds of things for you. And I've recommended a few there. The NIV study Bible is a good one. The ESV study Bible is a good one. But the one I recommend most, honestly, is the New Living Translation study Bible. And my wife reminded me this morning that they're often on sale at Ollie's, for those of you here local. And you don't have to get a fancy leather one with your name stamped on it. A cheap hardback copy will read just the same. That's fine. But in order, one of the reasons people can't understand Scripture is they don't understand the context And they don't understand some of the historical background. They don't understand who wrote the book, to whom it was written, and why it was written. If you know all those things, that's what context is. The when, where, what, and why. If you understand all that stuff, it's much easier to study. And by the way, I am glad that we have these things, these devotionals. These are great. This is not Bible study. Devotional readings are, are great, and they're very good to do with your, like your morning prayers or something like that, or evening prayers or whatever. They're very good. Read a devotion, pray. That's, that's wonderful. That's why we have these things. I thank God that we have them. But that's not study. Study is reading an entire book of the Bible all the way through, and sometimes rereading it and rereading it until you get it. That's Bible study. That's how you understand the Bible. And a good study Bible, right at the front, will tell you who wrote the book, to whom it was written, why, and even outlines it for you. I recommend that you read a book in one sitting. For some, like 1 Timothy, which I'm going to look at today, that's quick. It takes 15 minutes to read through 1 Timothy. For Romans and Acts, that takes a lot longer, but that's how you should do it. If you just read a chapter a day, and then you pick up the next chapter in a book like Romans, you're going to get lost. You're just going to get lost. You're going to forget what you read the day before. It's not going to flow. You're going to get confused. And by the way, when you pick up a study Bible and you start to study, and I pray you do and urge you do, that you set time away every day to study Scripture, book by book. But don't do this. I had somebody ask me this just recently. Okay, if I start to study my Bible, should I start in Genesis? No. No. 
Because if you start at the beginning and try to work your way through first time out, you'll get to Leviticus and quit. You just will. Start in the gospel. Start with the gospel of John or start with Luke Acts, something like that. Then move on. Then move on. Get yourself a good study Bible. And I know some of you are like, I don't know. You know, sometimes those can run $40, $50. Folks, it's the Word of God. One. Two, how much do you pay for Internet every month? Yeah. (laughs) Streaming services? How much do you pay? And all that stuff's going to go away one day, folks. This is eternal. It's worth the money. Get yourself a good study Bible. Read the introductions. Get the context. Who wrote it? Why did they write it? Who were they writing to? If you know that, you got you got a leg up and you can get going. That's how it's done. Now, The one thing I forgot to put in the bulletin because I was running out of space was this. It also helps to know the context of the Bible as a whole from 30,000 feet. If you know the big story, if you know the forest, then you can better understand the trees. If you know the big story from Genesis to Revelation, then you can put something like 1 Timothy in there and see how it fits. So here in just like two minutes... Or so, I'm going to give you the big picture. Here is the Bible in a nutshell. And I had to do this in seminary. I had a a professor say, I want you to write out in one page, double space, summarize the entire Bible. I was like, are you kidding me? He's like, nope. I had to do it. It can be done. God creates. Not because he needed to, but purely out of love. God needs nothing. He creates human beings, they sin, they disobey. Sin is spiritual treason, they disobey God. As a result, death and decay enter the world. And then it gets worse. Sin from Genesis 3 to Genesis 11, sin just gets wider and wider and wider. You get the first murder. God commands his people to scatter. They don't scatter. They gather together, build a tower of Babel. God said, I told you to scatter. And he emphasizes his point by knocking that tower down and says, now go. But then in Genesis 12, he does something interesting. There's a guy living out in a place called Ur named Abram. He later changed his name to Abraham. And God said, you, Through you, I'm going to build a nation. Through your family, I'm going to build a people. Not because you deserve it. In fact, you're the least of all people. But that will glorify me. And I'm going to take you out of slavery one day, and I'm going to take you to this land, the land of Israel, and I'm going to give it to you. Now, there's nothing magical about that land. Like I said, it's really cool to go to Israel. I've been... If you can go, you should go. It's really cool. However, you get there, and it looks like, like bad parts of Arizona. It, it, it's not going to blow you away. The looks of it aren't. The reason God chose that strip of land was because it was right at the cross-section of the east and the west. He didn't pick Israel just to be his people. He said, as my people, you will be a nation of priests. You will reach out to the rest of the world and show them who the one true God is. So when they travel through your country, whether coming from the east or coming from the west, they will see you, they will see that you are different, that you're hospitable, that you keep my law, that you love people, that you're giving, that there's no hungry among you, no homeless among you, all widows and orphans are cared for, and they will say, what is this? And you will say, it's because we worship the one true God. But the problem is, Israel was supposed to be the rescuer, but then they sinned, and they were in need of rescue. And all the way back in Genesis 3, we see God said, i got to do this myself. And so God comes in the form of a human being, Jesus Christ, 
And notice something about the story of Jesus. What does Jesus do? Goes to Egypt, returns, goes out to be tempted and tested in the desert, goes and starts to throw out demons and sickness, and forms a group of 12. Does that sound familiar to you? It's Israel. Israel goes out in the desert, are tested, they fail. Jesus is tested, he succeeds. Twelve tribes. And God commands the twelve tribes, go into the land, kick out the bad guys. Jesus comes along, he's tested, he succeeds, he comes back, he starts throwing out demon and sickness. What's he doing? Kicking out the bad guys. Jesus did what Israel could not, and then he goes to the cross to pay the penalty for our sins, dies in our place. And then he's resurrected again in victory, and he says to his 12, go now. Go scatter across the world. God told Israel, the world will come to you. Jesus tells us, you go to the world. With the same message, there is only one God. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And he says, oh, and by the way, While you're going out there planting churches, saving people, being my instruments, being my servants, uh, the clock is ticking. I will come back. That's the whole story of the Bible, folks. Now you can put all the books in there, including the one little part of a chapter we're going to look at today. Make sense? That's the big context. That's the big context. And the cool thing about a study Bible is, once you get the context of the book that you're going to read, if you start reading into it and you're like, "Eh, wait a minute, what is that? I don't understand what uh, this festival is. I don't understand what this is about. Well, wouldn't you know it? Your study Bible have little footnotes to almost every verse that will explain it to you. And then, if you're still confused... There are so many free resources out there, it's not even funny. Like my favorite, I put it on there, gotquestions.org. You can go to gotquestions.org, and you can type in Jonah, and there'll be 50 articles on Jonah. Find whatever you need. Short, usually like, what, Megan, four or five paragraphs on the web page when it doesn't answer. There's no reason not to understand scripture. We have so many resources, and praise the Lord, right now we have the freedom in this country to do it. And then if you're still confused, you can pick up a commentary, a Bible commentary, like this. This is a good one. A Bible commentary goes through verse by verse everything you need to know about that book. They can be expensive. You need to be cautious in which ones you buy. If you really need it, you can always message me, I'll tell you. Or, believe it or not, there's a website run by pastors called bestcommentaries.com where pastors rank the commentaries. See? Commentaries like the Tyndall commentary, the NIV application commentary, those commentaries are written for laymen. You don't want to go pick up something like the New International Greek textual commentary, which I have to read, That's written to fellow scholars and stuff like that. It has untranslated Greek and Aramaic. You don't want to mess with that. But there are commentaries out there that will help you. And let me urge you one other thing before we jump in to 1 Timothy. And we'll be in 1 Timothy 3 here in just a minute if you want to open your Bible or your Bible app. How many of you remember... Jim and Tammy Faye Baker. Remember them? They had one of the largest ministries in the world, PTL on TV. Even had an amusement park. I remember Tammy Faye, I think, applied her makeup with a double-barrel shotgun every morning. I I remember in the 80s seeing those T-shirts and you'd see what looked like a clown imprint on the shirt, and it said, I ran into Tammy Faye at the mall. Whew, they were something. Jim Baker went, of course, went to prison for tax evasion, tax fraud. Jim Baker, when he got out, repented and wrote a book that's actually worth reading, and it's simply entitled, I Was Wrong. 
And he admitted something in that book that you need to keep in mind. He said that as a minister of the gospel, he had never read the Bible all the way through, ever. That when he taught or preached, he decided what he wanted to say, and then he searched for a verse to take out of context to support it. Don't do that. Athletes do it all the time. Like how many of you have seen somebody like, you know, Steph Curry or somebody quote Philippians, I can do all things through God, and they think it means hitting a three-pointer. No, it does not. Paul makes it very clear when he says I can do all things through Christ, he means the things Christ wants me to do. And the last time I checked, I don't think God cares that much about three-pointers. But he does care about his kingdom. Don't take things out of context. That's called proof texting. Proof texting is when you decide that you're going to take this verse, you're not going to read anything around it, and you're just going to make it support what you want it to say. And let's face it, when you go into study scripture, understand this, because I have it, you have it, we all have our prejudices. We all have what we want to be true, and we will try to find it in the Bible. That's proof texting. But true Bible study is actually the opposite of proof texting. It's not finding what you want it to say. It's finding what God says, and typically if you find what God says and you really putting up a mirror to yourself, you will study the Scripture and go, ouch, that's me. I had a professor named Randy Harris who used to say, The number one question you need to ask yourself when studying Scripture is, what does this passage require me to change? That's number one. You've got to understand the big context of Scripture. You have to understand the context of the book that you're reading. And you can't do that verse, one verse a day, another verse a day. You've got to read the whole thing through. Dr. John Willis was my professor of Old Testament. He was, he's a sharp old dude. Um, when he would lecture on Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, it's a long book. He would lecture from memory. He had the book memorized in Hebrew. And he would lecture on it, and finally some of the students complained to the dean that that's a little bit intimidating. So they asked, will you please at least open your Bible to Isaiah and just have it open there? Even if you don't look at it, just the fact that Isaiah is open there, we won't feel so intimidated. So he did. And the classes were three hours long, and every 50 minutes we'd take a 10-minute bathroom break. And so when he was lecturing on Isaiah, he had his Bible open. I was running out to the restroom. I looked over. It was upside down. He wasn't looking at it. Dr. Willis said, A text without a context is a pretext for a proof text. Keep everything in context, 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 context. Who wrote it? Why? To whom? All that kind of stuff. You've got to know that to understand it. We're going to get to the book of Romans in a few months. And that's, that's, that's deep water, folks. That's one of the reasons we're doing this. You have to understand why... Paul is writing Romans to understand what's going on. There's a reason why that a church Paul's never been to, didn't found himself, he's writing to them and he opens the letter by saying, it's great to be Jewish, but Jews are sinners, Gentiles are sinners. First two chapters are, we're all sinners. Why is he doing that? Context. The Roman church had a lot of friction between Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. The Jewish Christians had been kicked out by one of the Roman emperors. The Gentile Christians stayed behind and ran the church. Then the next emperor comes along and says, you Jews can come back in. They come back in and they find the church they established run by somebody else and there was some tension. And so that's the reason Paul opens Romans 1 and 2 and saying, none of you get a VIP pass. You're all sinners. Does that make sense? That's why he opens the book that way. Context. 
You understand the context? You're good to go. You're good to go. Now, let's take the context of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy 3, along with Titus, has been a passage often abused and used hurtfully. And we'll talk more about that here in a second because it's not, it hasn't been very well translated, one, and two, it's been taken out of context. Taken out of context. Now, here's the deal. The Apostle Paul was what we would call today a church planter. He would go to a town and he would spread the gospel The Holy Spirit working through him would convert some people. So he'd form a church. He would lead that church until he identified some wise, mature people. He would appoint them as elders. Elders in the early church were the church leaders. They were the ministers. Elders were not a board of governors. They were the ministers of the church. You need to understand that. That's one. They also had deacons. Deacons, the entire existence of deacons, the whole reason deacons existed in the church was to care for the poor members of the church. That's the only role they had. Now, the reason why Paul says the deacons have to be people full of the spirit and full of wisdom is because they're handling the money. And if you remember a guy named Judas, the disciples had been burned once by that before, and they wanted to make sure anybody handling the money needs to be a mature, wise Christian. Now, we don't have deacons here. And now you need to understand, again, context, 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 because people abuse this all the time. Rome did not have a welfare system. If you were out of work, you were going hungry, or you'd have to steal or beg. There was no government agency to go to. Now, we do care for our people here. We do help. We have... We don't announce it. We don't want to embarrass anybody. We've paid people's rents during the pandemic, all that kind of stuff. We, we help people out, but we don't need an entire office to do that. People call the church. They talk to Paula. Paula says, okay, okay, give me your account numbers. I'll call the electric company. I'll call, you know, come by. I'll give you a Kroger card, all that kind of stuff. That's how we handle it. So we don't need deacons right now. But in the early church, that's what they did. The elders ran the church, the deacons took care of the poor. The apostles ran everything else, including Paul. But Paul knew that he was not long for this world. Paul knew that his day was coming, and it was. We think 1 Timothy was written around 62, around 64, 65. Within two, three years later, Paul would be beheaded as a traitor to the Roman Empire ordered by Nero. So, here's what Paul does. Paul had a succession plan in place. It's a very smart thing to do. A lot of churches do not have a succession plan, and they end up blowing up because of that. We have a succession plan. At 62, I'm 49. At 62, I have to have a person on staff, full-time, ready to take my place. And I co-pastor with them for three years. Then at 65, I can either retire or I can stay on staff, but I'm not lead pastor anymore. I'll go ahead and, spoiler alert, I love you all, but I'm out of here. And and I'll tell you why. It's not because I don't love you. It's because I don't want to stick around and have people looking at me as I'm still their pastor. It's like, no, 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 no. This guy's got the job. Take the reins, buddy. Does that make sense? So that's my thought. Now, Paul had a succession plan. He had two guys that he was training to take his place as a church planter, Timothy and Titus. Remember, again, the big context of Scripture. Israel was created for the world to come to them and to show them the one true God. But Jesus says, as the church, you go out to the world and show them the one true God. That's what Paul's doing. By going and planting churches in city after city after city, he is fulfilling the commands of of his Lord and King, Jesus Christ. And now he's helping Timothy. Timothy is is a young guy. He's in Ephesus. 
Paul wanted to come see him, but he got delayed. And so he writes him a letter and says, I'm just encouraging you. And remember, keep these things in mind when you plant churches. And by the way, folks, I'm a big fan of church planting. I am. We're planting a church in Uganda, obviously. But be careful. One of the reasons why biblical illiteracy is so high and one of the reasons why the church is in the shape that it is in, and in fact, I just had this discussion with somebody last week, do you know that in America 85 churches close a week? And with church plants, which is a wonderful thing, but you need to be careful. There is a culture within Christianity that is toxic. And the culture is this. The few people, and there are not many anymore, but the few people who get into ministry, who go to Bible college or they go to seminary, and Megan can back me up on this because she worked at a Christian university and she talked to a lot of them, they all think they're going to be a megachurch pastor. They all think a megachurch is a church of 2,000 or more. They all think they're going to be the next Andy Stanley. They all think they're going to be the next Stephen Furtick. They all think they're going to be the next Joel Osteen. And to do that, guess what the temptation is? Not to preach the Word of God, preach what they want to hear. And then, when it doesn't happen, because it rarely does, they quit. Or it explodes. And they do something stupid. 70% of pastors in an anonymous survey admit they want to quit the ministry. 70%. we got a lot of praying to do for our churches, folks. And one of those church planting networks, I'm tempted to say it, but I won't, which one it is. But there's a church planting network, one of the biggest ones in the country. They're run out of Florida. When I worked for ADF, For eight years, I had a donor in New Jersey, and he wanted me to come with him to Florida, to his summer home in Florida. He had that kind of money. He was rich. And he wanted me to come down to Florida and see this church planning network, see their training program. I said, okay. Guy gives you $150,000 a year, says he wants you to come to Florida and stay in his retirement home on the beach. Well, for the Lord. So I fly down there. He takes me. I don't know anything about this group. Had never heard of them before. I spend all day at their training program. He's like, what do you think? What do you think? Isn't this cool? I'm like, hey, we'll, we'll talk about it. So we go out to dinner that night. He said, all right, Matt, I know something's on your mind. Tell me. He said, okay. I said, Jim, here's my problem. I was talking to the church planners that they're training. Not a single one of them had a Bible or a theology degree. And his response to me was, yeah, they don't think that's important. Would you let somebody operate on you who didn't have a medical background? He said, the important thing is marketing skills. I said, what about the Word of God? What about knowing the Word of God, understanding the Word of God, teaching the Word of God? He said, oh, they send them their sermons every week. I said, what? He said they pick the sermon series for them, and they send them the outline for their sermon, all they have to do. So all they have to do is repeat it? Yeah. Well, they can fill in some things. Does that look anything like what we saw in Acts? If the church is not built on the Word of God, what is it built on? Ego? Ego? You got to be careful. You got to be careful. This church, as long as I'm living and have everything to say about it, will be built on the Word of God. Let's look at 1 Timothy 3 1 through 13. Now remember, Paul is writing to a guy he's training to take his place as a church planter. And in this, He gives him some encouraging words in the first couple chapters. He tells him, I know you're young, but look, if you get any pushback, don't you back down. You stand on the Word of God. 
And don't let anybody, false teachers, come in. If a false teacher comes into the church you're planning, you run them out of there. And we've had to do that. Dad's had to do that. I've had to do that when I was, when I was a church planter. People come in, they want to take over, they got kind of weird theories and stuff like that, and rapture charts and all kind of stuff. It's like, I don't know, God bless you, but don't let the door hit your butt on the way out. And by the way, that's biblical. And now he comes to this. This is an example of verses that have been taken out of context and have been abused. I'm reading from the New Living Translation because I'm encouraging you, if you're having trouble studying your Bible, get the New Living Translation study Bible. I don't get any kickbacks from it, folks. I'm not an investor or anything. I'm just telling you that it works. When I, the first time I taught through Romans, I used the ESV. That was a mistake. When I taught through using the ESV, people had no idea what I was talking about. They could not follow it. So the second time I taught Romans to a men's Bible study, I used the New Living Translation. I still remember Ralph Clay came up to me and said, I finally get Romans. That's what the difference a translation can make. And so 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 13, and this is from the New Living Translation. This is a trustworthy saying. This is Paul to Timothy. If someone aspires or desires to be a church leader, he desires an honorable position. So a church leader must be a man whose life is above reproach. Stop. This gets abused all the time. Here's another principle. Scripture interprets Scripture. What does Paul mean? He's going to later say have a good reputation. Does that mean this is a person who's never done anything wrong or never faced gossip or slander or an attack? It's not what it means. It can't. Why? Did they lie about Jesus? They lie about Paul? You got to keep that in mind. He's talking about among people who No, and this next one is the one that's really been abused, and the New Living Translation gets this right. He must be faithful to his wife. Most of your translations say something different, don't they? They say something like, he must be a husband of one wife. Would it shock you to learn there is no Greek word for wife? Doesn't exist. The verse in Greek literally says, he must be a one-woman man. That's what it says. This has been abused. When my dad was at another church, before he founded Christ Community Church, back when dinosaurs walked the earth, he got into a kerfuffle over this. They wanted to take a deacon off the deacon's board because his wife had divorced him. And dad stood up and said, whoa, 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 hold on a second. First of all, she divorced him. He didn't divorce her. He was faithful. He's in the clear. He's innocent. Don't do that. That's not what the Bible says. And he tried to explain this to him. The Bible says a one-woman man. And they said, nope. People who had never studied Greek, and my dad had studied Greek, were trying to tell him what the Greek meant. That's a bad idea. This has been so abused. Charles Stanley went through this. When Charles Stanley's wife left him, Baptists all across the South said, you should resign. He said, I didn't. And his wife had been, he's never cheated on me. He's been a faithful husband. I just don't want to be his wife anymore. I don't want to be a pastor's wife anymore. And they said, no, you should resign. First Timothy. They're not understanding First Timothy. Put this in context, historical background. One Roman historian said, every Roman man has a wife, a mistress, and a favorite prostitute. That was part of the culture. It was accepted. What Paul is saying when he writes, remember, Timothy, an elder must be, a church leader must be a one-woman man. He's saying, no mistresses, no prostitutes. He's saying nothing about Divorce, he's dead. I mean, goodness sakes, if somebody's wife dies and they remarry, does that mean they have to go sell insurance instead of being a minister? That doesn't make any sense. Paul is saying, 
He must be faithful to his wife. The New Living Translation gets it right. He must be faithful to his wife. He must exercise self-control. Live wisely. Have a good reputation. He must enjoy having guests in his home. I'm working on that one. Megan's forcing me to. And he, notice that, sorry, it's a he, must be able to teach. He must know the Bible. He must not be a heavy drinker or be violent. Paul nowhere says, and nowhere in the Scripture does it say, that a Christian or a church leader cannot have some kind of drink. In fact, what does he tell Timothy? If you read through First and Second Timothy, he tells Timothy, Timothy, remember, have a little wine for your stomach. Now, fundamentalists like to say that's grape juice. That ain't grape juice. They did not have preservatives until the 18th century, which means that every fruit does what? It ferments. But he must not be a heavy drinker. He can't be a drunk. He cannot be violent. He must be gentle, not quarrelsome. I'm working on that one. And not love money. I'm working on that one. He must manage his own family well having children who respect and obey him. For if a man cannot manage his own household, how can he take care of God's church? A church leader must not be a new believer because he might become proud and the devil would cause him to fall. I saw this. I should have taken five years after graduating seminary before I started ministry. I really should have. I regret that. Also, people outside the church must speak well of him so that he will not be disgraced and fall into the devil's trap. In the same way, deacons must be well-respected and have integrity. Again, they're handling the money. They must be he- not be heavy drinkers or dishonest with money. I think one follows the other, right? They must be committed to the mystery of the faith now revealed and must live with a clear conscience. Before they are appointed deacons, let them be closely examined. If they pass the test, then let them serve as deacons. In the same way, their wives must be respected and must not slander others. They must exercise self-control and be faithful in everything they do. A deacon must be faithful to his wife, and he must manage his children and household well. Those who do well as deacons will be rewarded with respect from others and will have increased confidence in their faith in Christ Jesus. Must be well-respected. Not, that doesn't mean, by the way, well-liked. There's a difference between respected and liked. i tell you something I've learned from my father. My father can be a little direct. But I know people who will tell me, and I've had people tell me, I don't like your dad, but I respect him. I know he always tells me the truth. That's what Paul means by respect. That you're an honest person. Now, did that translation help you? See what difference a translation makes? See what a difference understanding the background makes, understanding the context makes? Paul is telling Timothy, take this seriously because you are building outposts for the kingdom of God to obey our Lord's command. So you take church leadership seriously. That's why we've had people come in here it's like, I was saved last night. God's called me to preach. Not here he hasn't. You're a brand new believer. Sorry. But I have been called to serve the kingdom. Great. Go clean the bathroom. No, you don't understand. I understand if you're not willing to clean the bathroom, you got no business preaching. We take these commands very seriously. We take this very seriously, but we understand them in context. In context. And that's important. There's no excuse for you not to know your Bible. I had somebody tell me last night, Matt, I can't sit down and read an entire book like Romans in one sitting. I don't have that kind of time. I said, oh, okay. When you came in, you were talk- belly aching about the Buckeye game. How many hours did you spend watching that? You got time to watch a movie. You got time to watch a football game, but you don't have time to read a book of the Bible. 
But what you re- let's be honest. What you're saying is, I don't want to. And you should repent. It's the Word of God. Knowing the Word of God. You can be a Christian and not know the Word of God, but it makes a difference. You can't really impact the kingdom or be a disciple unless you know the Word of God. Let me give you an example and I'll quit. John Newton became a Christian while he was a slave trader. He continued to be a slave trader for some time. The man who wrote Amazing Grace was a slave trader. But then he started to study his Bible. And once he really started to study his Bible and, he, and really got to know the Word of God, not only did he quit being a slave trader, he teamed up with a guy by the name of William Wilberforce and outlawed slavery all throughout the British kingdom. He was a Christian when he was a slave trader. I know that's controversial to say, but he didn't know the Word of God. Once he knew the Word of God and knew that every person was made in the image of likeness of God, he knew he could no longer do what he was doing. Not only did he know he could no longer do what he was doing, he knew he had to put a stop to it. He was a Christian, but when he got to know the Word of God, he was a kingdom warrior. And that's what I hope and pray for every single one of you. Don't be embarrassed. Unless the Lord comes today or something tragic happens, you got time. Dig in. Open the gospel. Get yourself a New Living Translation, I guess, at Ollie's. Go to the Gospel of John. Go to Luke. Go to Acts. Start studying. Put time aside every day to study the Word of God so that you, like John Newton, can possibly be transformed. John Newton's best work may be, best known work may be Amazing Grace, but I always love the quote he quoted about once he understood Scripture and began to serve God in accordance with Scripture. He said, I am not what I should be. I am not what I will be. But by the grace of God, I'm not what I was. Study your Bible. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Son, our salvation. And we thank you in grace upon grace you have given these 66 books to us. You've raised up scholars to help us understand it. Translating from Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic. Given us so many resources and so much time and I just and the freedom to study it. I, we pray for those in Iran and China and North Korea that have to smuggle your word underground. For those in Afghanistan who can be killed for just simply possessing your word. We have the freedom here. Let us not let it go by. Let us take that freedom and study your word and grow to serve your kingdom well. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. God goes with you. I'm off to do homework and then watch the Bengals lose. Have a great week. Christ Community meets on Saturday at 5 p.m. and Sunday at 10.30 a.m. For more information, visit www.christcommunity.net or check out our Facebook page.